welcome to part four of this, uh, uh, well, what was originally going to be a three-part episode. Today we're going to talk about the aftermath of the Malays era. In the intro of the first two parts, I asked if the American auto industry finally lost its worldwide dominance. I hope I can give an answer with this fourth part. The focus is going to be a bit less on history, the 90s and zeros will be covered, but more so a critical analysis of the current day American automotive industry. And before I get comments like, oh here comes another European tank and he can criticize our national car industry. I hope you can tell by now, I have a YouTube channel mostly devoted to American cars based on love and not hate. Please, my fellow American viewers, for this episode, take off your red, white and blue colored glasses and take a hard, long and honest look at your current day auto industry. It seems like with many things in life, America always likes to take it into the extreme. There is never really a middle ground, whether it's economy, politics, societal matters or the car industry. The good times are really good and the bad times are really bad. The good times are really good and the bad times are really bad. It leads to the impression that the American car industry is all about short term with a lack of long term vision. Let's focus on the good times right now and we will see what happens tomorrow. The oil crisis and as a result the Malays era were a wake up call and sure enough by the late 80s car makers showed that they can make things that are truly good but they needed a little push. The Malays era was the wake up call but have they really woken up? Let me show you what I mean. As soon as the 80s ended, all and everything was looking up. The economy was doing great and the dark days of the late 70s were slowly forgotten. The American automotive industry celebrated this by immediately falling back into old patterns. Introducing the GMB bodies, cars like the Chevrolet Caprice, Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser, Buick Roadmaster and the Cadillac Fleetwood. These cars were huge and the 90s embodiment of 70s land yardism, if that's even a word. They were, along with the competitors like the Ford Crown Victoria and the Lincoln Town Car, the last dinosaurs, the last real American traditional full-size sedans, made during a time when the sedan was rapidly falling out of favor. For this, the SUV. In the American quest for the big car, the SUV was the next chapter. Many viewers pointed out that the rise of the SUV started as early as the late 70s as commercial vehicles like pickup trucks and vans and SUVs as far as they existed were exempt of government rules. Thank you for this. I was not entirely aware of this but it instantly reminded me of this, the Dodge Little Red Express truck. See, this was an option package. In those days, pickup trucks were still bare bone work vehicles but a luxury addition, now common practice, were on a rise. This, and you wouldn't believe it, was one of the most powerful cars in America during its time. Why? Because of a loophole. This truck did not have the catalytic converter and pretty much made the performance figures that many American passenger cars made before the whole malaise era and emission regulations had started. And I guess this has formed the basis for pickups and SUVs to become so popular. But I'm not sure, and please correct me if I'm wrong. And this is my European mind running loose, because if I think of an SUV, I think of cars like this, but you guys over in America consider this more like a crossover. Because by definition, an SUV in the United States is always truck or commercial vehicle based. And so, all throughout time, after the Malays era in the 1980s, America never really invested time, money and energy in making small economy cars again. Station wagons were on their way out in favor of minivans and later on the SUV and it's only during economic recessions that some car makers tried at making compact economy cars, like the Dodge Neon of the 90s. Another strategy is to not invest in economy cars but instead selling off brands. After the 9-11 downturn, GM sold Oldsmobile. But don't you worry, GM instantly celebrated the happy zeros by coming up with a new brand, Hummer. <sighs> America at its finest. It's big, it's an SUV and it's military inspired. But above all, it is freedom, vehicularly incarnated with a huge emphasis on car. 
This is a rolling 4th of July. You too can get a military-inspired Screaming Eagle tank on wheels with a slice of real 100% authentic American process freedom on the side. Sorry, I can take this car seriously. It's not what it is, it's what it represents. A caricature of the American auto industry. GTA 4 has come to real life. But then we had the crisis of 2008 and the following Great Recession and boy were they in for a selling spree. Hummer? Gone. Pontiac? Gone. Saturn? Gone. Mercury? Gone. Overall, it seems like that the American appetite for the big car never really went away. It only changed its shape. And my question is, why? Is it because of generations upon generations have been brainwashed by the big three that bigger is always better and the level of success is measured by the size of the automobile? Or is it something else? I know that your infrastructure is a bit different and built to a different standard compared to almost anywhere else. Long distance travels, wide open roads. Over here in the Netherlands, a two hour drive is considered a long drive. Heck, I'd already be in another country. But then again, Germany and France are also pretty big countries and both these countries had a huge success selling small cars. So the question remains, why do Americans dislike small cars? Why do they ridicule them? Why can they only rarely make a good compact economy car? I don't know the answer, but I'd love to know. I could only guess maybe the gas prices. But still, really, it is not about why SUVs and pickup trucks are so popular, it's why the big car is still so popular. And I looked it up and some people say it's because of practicality, but you can still get a very practical car that's a bit smaller. I mean, seriously, if you are like a four-person household, why do you need an Escalade? I'm not buying it, it is just only fuel or practicality. Has anything changed since the Malays era? Did the American auto industry ever learn from it? Well, by the looks of it, not really. You know what? For the fun of it, let's have a look at your current day auto industry. GM once had the price letter figured out with five divisions. Currently only three are left. Oldsmobile was dropped in 2004 and Pontiac followed in 2009 after losing a game of spinning the bottle. Chevrolet, Buick and Cadillac are left. And GMC, but I'm leaving that one out of the picture for now. Chevrolet is doing okay and I wouldn't expect anything less from the Volkswagen of America. Buick still suffers from its grandpa image and manages to just only survive by only selling SUVs and crossovers. And then there is Cadillac, once a revered name. It's doing very well in China, just like Buick, moderately in the US, but sales are almost non-existent almost anywhere else. And you can't say that about the German luxury brands, now can you? Ford had to kiss Middlemark Mercury goodbye in 2011. Because what was Mercury? A warmed over Ford or a watered down Lincoln? And talking about Lincoln, much like Cadillac, it's not having a lot of success either in the home market. Their best-selling vehicles, much like Cadillac, are, you guessed it, SUVs. Every so often I see comments like, Lincoln and Cadillac should make those land yachts again, That's, that'll do them some good. Guess what? They did. And guess what? They didn't sell at all. Now, Ford is doing pretty solid with their F-150 pickups, consistently ranking as the best-selling vehicle in the US and, well, really the entire world. But also, Ford decided to drop their hatchback and sedan models altogether. They only sell SUVs, crossovers and pickups these days. And, oh yeah, the Mustang, because Mustang. Over at Chrysler, it isn't getting any better, because let's face it, what is Chrysler? The showrooms are filled, if they are filled at all, with a fine selection of not one, but two models. A five-year-old minivan, a market segment that has been dead for over 20 years, and a 10-year-old sedan, a market segment also rapidly becoming extinct. Jeep is doing good, but hey, it's SUV, so yeah. And then there is Dodge. If we take away the Ram pickup, the Caravan minivan, and the Durango SUV, what is left are two normal cars. Hmm, okay. The Challenger Coupe and the Charger sedan. Finally, some normal cars, right? 
wrong. It is either full throttle or nothing at all. The third muscle car war is in full swing with the Dutch models. RT, Hellcat, Elephant, Red Eye, Demon. Seriously, what is so fun at having 800 horsepower stuffed in a two-door? Or even an SUV? In order to stay relevant, Dodge just Hellcats all the things. And I can't wait to see an 800 horsepower minivan. Don't get me wrong. These are great cars, they keep on pushing the performance boundaries, but they are never going to save you as a company when the next crisis hits. Why can't you get a normal car anymore from American car makers? Why does it have to be either big or way overpowered or both? Let's have a look at the top 10 best selling cars in the US. Now, it, it, it says a lot that the top three cars are domestic and are all pickups. Number four, five and six are crossovers. And finally, in seventh place, we find a normal sedan made by a non-American car company. And finally, in eighth place, we find the compact slash European size hatchback, the Toyota Corolla. But let's have a closer look at the top three, the pickup trucks. And very strictly speaking, if we define pickup as a car, then American cars have even grown since the 70s. Take a look. Pickups are today's equivalent of 1970s land yachts and are even bigger than them. I believe I'm correct if I say that pickups have way overshot their intended purpose. No longer are they exclusively owned by contractors and gardeners, right? Let's be honest here. Even Joe the desk jockey has one these days. And I guess the very best example of the American automotive industry of the present day and the near future is this. The GMC Hummer. Here we go again. GM. Why? Why does it have to be a four-ton tank? Why does it have to have a thousand horsepower and 15,000 newton meters of torque, if that's even true? And why is it named Hummer? Because <laughs> the Hummer is better for environment, but look at it now, it's electric, <laughs> can you tell? Why does it have these stupid easter eggs referring to Apollo moon landings? And why does it have this stupid crap walk? Why can't you just make a normal electric car? Why does it always have to be so overly excessive at everything. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here because GM did make an okay electric car, the Chevy Bolt. But that's not much of a success now, is it? And why is that? Why is it that Tesla is way better at selling electric cars? And I'm not fanboying Tesla here, but I get a sense that eventually someone woke up thinking, if these industry giants are not making electric cars, then I'll do it. And they did. And it's a success. GM, where were you in 2012? Chrysler, where were you in 2012? Ford, where were you in 2012? And here we are, 10 years later. We have an oversized tank, an underperforming MPV, and this, the all new electric. M m m m I, I, I can't even say its name. M m m m Mustang. And I can only sit here, across the Atlantic, Wondering what will happen when the next big crash comes and the neo malaise era will happen and I have to make a video about it, which would be part 5. It is only a matter of time. Okay, so this, sorry guys, but this was really the last part of the malaise era and uh, I did not expect this to become really a smash hit, but thank you. Uh, so yeah, th th that's the reason why there was also a part four. I I I I could go on, okay? I could make this probably a ten-part series, and I know that you guys would probably love it because there are still plenty of stories I did not uh, cover, like the Chevrolet Citation, or uh, like cars like the GMC Cyclone, you know, as as, as part of the the revival part. Um, but you have to understand that sometimes stories can become a little stale once again like the Chevrolet citation like you know the same old same old story once again an American car company tries to make a new economy car and once again it fails and you know so you have to kind of keep moving on I do want to end this mini series within one episode we are still at episode 20 uh, now we're moving up to uh, episode 21 um, but I want to take a moment to thank this man. 
This whole four-part episode devoted to the Malays era could not have happened without the work of this man. I don't know whether he invented the term Malays era or he was like the first person to use it in his articles, but uh, like the Malays era only gained a bit of recognition back in 2011. It's not like this era happened in the 70s and people already got a name for it in the 80s some 10 years later. It's 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 only recently that the that the period that American car makers just struggled, roughly the late 70s, early 80s, became known as the Malays era. But now it has a name tag. And I want to end with, look, I, I really bashed these cars, you know, and it's very easy to criticize them. And I see a lot of comments saying, I don't know why you, you, you criticize them. I love them for what they are. Don't you worry, I love them as well. Late 70s Lincolns, etc. I think they're just awesome. They are really the lounges on wheels. You know, it's, it's like coming home while you just left your home. And I can't stress this enough that, that Ed Sodder Reviews is, is based on the love of the American car, whether they are good or bad. Music